so often it's company culture. Like okay. we started this company, you know, our founder started the company and they were this ace sales person and they hired great ace sales people and, and it was all about net new. And then after they got all these customers and this big machine going, now we started to fix our retention and we got mm-hmm. retention right up. This is how we do things here. Mm. This works. Why would we want to go and do something different? And mm-hmm. you think, well, why wouldn't you? I mean, don't you want to keep improving? Well, that's, that's just so often not the case. Welcome to the Full Funnel Freedom Podcast. If you are listening to this, you are likely leading a team responsible for generating revenue. Purpose of Full Funnel Freedom is to support people like yourself and keep your funnels consistently, reliably full. Welcome to the Full Funnel Freedom Podcast. I'm your host, Hamish Knox. Today, I am delighted to have Dan Fister. As my guest, Dan is the creator of the WinBack process and the founder of WinBack Labs. He was also a co-founder at Business Source Group, where he helped generate over 50,000 customers. While at Business Source, Dan created the WinBack process, launched WinBack Labs, and he's also the host of the WinBack Marketing Podcast. Dan, welcome to Full Funnel Freedom. Great to be here, Hamish. Thanks for having me on. So I heard you on my friend Marcus's podcast and loved your ideas and insights that you shared. I'm grateful that you can uh, join us today and support the sales leaders who are listening around the world in learning more about this idea of winbacks and why it's so important. Before we get to that, though, I've given the audience the 50,000 foot view of who you are and what you've done. Take us down a level. Tell us the story of Dan. Where did you start? How did you get to where you are today? And where are you going? Well, I'm uh, I'm a marketing nerd. I have been for decades. I mm-hmm. just I just love it. Uh, a number of years ago, 1998, myself and two other people, we founded a uh, a business uh, aggregation uh, subscription service, and we ended up summarizing business books and creating leadership products. And we, you know, we've been you know put through the meat grinder in 2001 with the dot com crash, and mm-hmm. and we we pivoted, and then in 2008. We went through another meat grinder and we came out of that again, um, you know, totally changed our business model again. And so uh, by about 2016, things were going really well. We generated uh, in total over 50,000 customers, as you'd said. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the wheels started to come off and it was like our our attrition started to go up. Our win rates started to go down. Mm. And that was my, that was my area, right? That was, Mm. I had to fix that. And so um, we had already tried to, uh, win back past customers. Whenever anybody left, we sent out an email mm-hmm. um, for a big clients like our. You know, we lost our, this big uh, uh, mutual fund company. Uh, I was too afraid to actually go out because I didn't. I didn't know what I was going to hear. Like we had serviced him, them like crazy. They were, mm. you know, it's a six figure deal a year, six figure a year deal. And so we really, um, you know, did everything we possibly could to keep them satisfied when they left a um, mm-hmm. bit of a shell shock mm-hmm. anyway. So I created this, uh, this, this win back program. Basically I just threw everything I could possibly think of in marketing to get mm-hmm. these lost customers back. Right. And um, I wasn't very optimistic because we'd already reached out to them, right? You know, most of them mm-hmm. and, uh, and whoever was going to come back already had come back. Anyway, our back was against the wall, launched the, the, the program right out of the gate of 57 X ROI. This was like, the fastest, easiest, lowest cost money I ever made. It was nuts. I, I was just wow. beside myself. So um, I rolled it out. That was a test. We did a mm-hmm. test with a small group of people. So we rolled it out and the results maintained themselves. That wasn't mm-hmm. just like an outlier. That was that was for real. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what I did is I spent the next couple of years optimizing the process. Mm-hmm. And after I squeezed all the juice out of win back that I could find, uh, what I did was I did a study and I interviewed all these other people who'd done win back. So mm-hmm. I got this tremendous pers- perspective on all these different in- industries, how they do win back. The great thing about the study was we got metrics. There aren't many win back metrics out there, at least nothing mm-hmm. that I've seen uh, recent. Uh, so that was great. So we got metrics and we got, I got all kinds of other ideas and then mm-hmm. finished the study. <laughs> it's just like I'm all bummed out. I, there's no more fun people to talk about win back with. Uh, <laughs> so I started the podcast. And um, so I interviewed a lot of smart people who've done WinBack on the podcast, mm. and um, I'm putting it all together in a book right now. 
I love it. I can't wait to have it to be able to read that book when it gets uh, out in the world. Uh, I love the fact that you took some data uh, and and really it wasn't just like, hey, I did a cool thing. You you, you really dived into that, and as you said, marketing nerd uh, perspective, and wanted to get some real, you know, authentic uh, authentication. I guess would be a good way of saying it. So let's talk about that data really quickly because I've heard you uh, and read some of your your content. The, the and you already said 57x ROI. Tell us more about what that data showed because a lot of times when someone, you know, when we, we a client leaves, it, it we we do take it personally, right? It's kind of like you rejected me. And so it can be very challenging for us as sales leaders as well as our sellers to go back out and 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 re-prospect them, if you will. So what did the data tell you about winbacks versus other types of of develop business development. The first thing is is that people will come back and they will mm. come back in large numbers. I mean, that was the mm. biggest. You know, we think that when people leave, um, they left because they didn't like us or we did mm. something wrong. And you know, why would we want to go and do that? Let's just get net new. You know, but but that isn't the case. Not even close. Okay. And um, here's the thing: we think we know what other people are thinking, but we're so wrong. It's nuts. Um, there was a study done by a professor at the uh, University of Chicago, and he found that only 20% of the time do we have any idea what the other person is thinking. And even with our spouses, mm-hmm. or we're only up to 30%. I mean, we we project so much. And as a matter of fact, there's also studies done, um, uh, geez, I'm not sure who did it. I think Close did it. And what they found was that the reasons for people not coming back or not, not closing and the CRM was only right like 15% of the time. People leave for many, many reasons because, you know, they were lured away by a competitor. Um, they leave uh, because their situation has changed. They, mm. they leave because there's a change in leadership. There's mm. so many reasons why people leave mm. where, like, let's just say they they go beat for a, 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 to a competitor. But they might mm. find out for three months, they're actually better off with you, you know? Mm. Um, some people just like new. You know, it's like they've been with you for a mm-hmm. while and they want to try something new. Yeah. And and then there's the people who who left because of something that you did. Mm. And what's really interesting is so many of those people will come back if you approach them properly. I'll just give you a really high level view of what, what that means. Please. When, when they leave because they're unhappy, the last thing that they think about you is that thing that was unhappy, right? Mm-hmm. That unhappy situation. Yeah, and so there's something called the peak end rule that Daniel Kahneman uh, yes. wrote about. Right, love so it. There, there, there's two big ways people have an impression of you. Right, they've got mm. at, a, at a peak time or at the end. Well, this mm-hmm. is the end, and at the end, it, uh, how they feel about you has a disproportionately large um, uh, weighting. Mm-hmm. So, what we do is the very first thing when you want to win somebody back is you reach out to them and you want to make a new that last touch. Mm-hmm. A positive one, right? Now your last touch, which is negative, had a disproportionately large thing. Now mm-hmm. you make it a positive one. Mm-hmm. You have to, everybody wants to, to feel heard. They want to feel valued. They want to feel mm-hmm. appreciated. If they leave, ask to hear their story. I mean, it's always going to be different. Like, mm-hmm. uh, but just in general, let them, you know, tell their story or let them tell you what, what, what happened or let them, you know, show empathy at, at mm-hmm. minimum. Okay. Totally. So, Step one, again, we're really condensing this down, but step one is make that last touch mm-hmm. positive, okay? Mm-hmm. So that kicks in the peak end rule. So now the next last thing they think about you is at least neutral mm-hmm. and, prob- and hopefully positive. Yeah. So what that does is that, first of all, that mitigates a ton of negative word of mouth, right? Mm-hmm. So if they're going to be talking about you, they're not going to be talking negatively. And so the next step is uh, you try to solve the problem. Mm-hmm. You know, and you know, so a lot of problems they're they're insoluble. Mm-hmm. However, a lot of them aren't. But just the simple act mm-hmm. of trying to fix something has a tremendously powerful effect. It's called the mm-hmm. pratfall effect, and and what it basically says is that if you simply try to fix a problem, people will you will be more likable, and people will be more inclined to see you favorably. Mm-hmm. And, um, there was a study that uh, was done by Marriott Hotels that really kind of hmm. hit this home for me. And what they found was that they they surveyed um, uh, guests, mm-hmm. and their guests who who had no problems at all, they were asked, "What is the likelihood that you'll come back?" 
Mm. And 89% of them said, we'll come back. Mm -hmm. The people who had a problem that wasn't fixed, only 69% said they'd come back. But the people who had a problem that was fixed, 94% said that they would come back. Whoa. So in other words, if you had a problem that was fixed, you were even more likely to come back. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's because you've been through something together. You, they were on your side. They cared. Even if it wasn't fixed, mm -hmm. just the act that you've been through something together so, um, uh, has, a, has a huge impact. So, mm -hmm. so in our win back, if we reach out, click in the peak end rule by, you know, making that last touch more po uh, positive and then try to solve the problem, you can so often you can turn unhappy customers into advocates. It's so important not to let your own thinking about mm -hmm. the probability of a past customer coming back. Mm -hmm. um, you don't let that cloud your thinking. What's it going to cost you to bring them back? Okay, so the average the average um, uh, program uh, in in my study brought in four hundred eighty five k for a, for a small to medium sized business. Okay, wow, four hundred eighty five thousand dollars for an SMB, and what they reported was it only cost. It costs five thousand dollars or less to run that campaign. To run so, the campaign, not to win back each individual person. It was five thousand oh, for the to campaign. To do the whole thing. To do the whole thing. So soup to nuts. That's what it cost. And 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 the reason it costs so little is because the cost of acquisition has already been paid. Right? You already spent oh, your money man. in the ads or the zoom in for or whatever. You've already. Put your reps out there qualifying these these uh these people you you've already, you've already educated them on your product you've already built the relationships all that costs a lot of money you've got your sales reps doing all that work right totally you don't need to do that with win back you need yeah. to you might need to reawaken the relationship mm -hmm. you might need to go and do you know reach out and and, and talk to them mm -hmm. but that costs a fraction of the amount of time yeah and 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 these these are such well qualified customers mm -hmm. they they know your brand they know you so you got familiarity on your side mm -hmm. um uh, they chose you above all your of your competitors at one point in time so there's something special about you that's appealing mm -hmm. and there's just so many reasons why they would come back let's die let's dive a little bit further into this as so ultimately we have uh customers who already know who we are yep. we have data we can yep. so we can much more personalize, and yep. I love I love what you said about the this peak end rule because uh, I mean I know even when I started in sales years ago and someone and by the way for listeners out there if your client calls your seller and says we're leaving they're giving them a gift because how many of us have ever switched brands with never telling the the previous brand that we were we were moving away and I know I did this where I was like come on Dan like give us another chance like come on what if I give you a discount and of course your mind's already closed like this is the thing that we don't realize is when they call to tell us it's not I'm calling to hopefully get a discount it's I'm moving and I'm giving you a gift of telling you. So we can drop a case of dynamite on their mental model of what it is and it's never going to change. However, if we say, Dan, I would really appreciate working with you. Are you okay if we stay in touch? Would you ever consider coming back to us? And, and you're like, yeah, I mean, if you do this, 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 and this, I would certainly be, be open to that. And so as leaders, coach your sellers to ask those questions, to stay present, don't get emotionally involved and ask those questions back. Because as Dan said, illustrated, you have a lot easier time of bringing customers back when you do reach out to them again in whatever period of time that might be. So Dan, here's here's where I'm, where I'm curious about this. Number one is, why the heck don't we do this? Like you just laid out how that this is like one of the highest ROI sales activities that we could probably do. Why are we not doing it? That's that's the question I ask all the time it, on my podcast. I always ask that question because it's a fascinating question, right? And and I get a lot of different answers. Uh, for me, I know that it's it, you know this is crazy, but my lower value customers, I will go out and, and reach out to them much more easily than I'll reach out to one of my huge clients that I've lost because I think you're just kind of putting yourself out in the line. I don't want to hear all the bad things that I did. I don't want to hear all the wrong things that I did. I don't sure. want to hear that I suck. You know? <laughs> and and I think that that that's one thing. And and you know I think this is one of the reasons why I got so excited about Winback is mm. because I found that that's not true. They're not going to tell you that you suck. 
Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to tell you, this is what we need to come back. Or, you know what, uh, our situation has changed or or new leadership came in. Mm-hmm. You know, there's all kinds of reasons. And, and even if people are mad, it's like you said, it's a gift. Like, mm-hmm. you know, something's going gone sideways in your business. They told you or you learned from them what, what was wrong. Mm-hmm. And when you fix that problem, all the customers, all your current customers that are gonna we're gonna leave for that aren't gonna leave anymore, right? Because you've just you've just fixed a piece of your retention problem. Totally. Yeah. So that's another huge gift of uh, of win back. So often it's company culture. Like okay. we started this company, you know, our founder started the company and they were this ace sales person and they hired great ace salespeople and and it was all about net new and then after they got all these customers and this big machine going now we started to fix our retention and we got Mm -hmm. retention right up this is how we do things here Mm. this works why would we want to go and do something different and Mm -hmm. you think well why wouldn't you i mean don't you want to keep improving well that's that's just so often not the case sales leaders ai is here and it means that sales is evolving is your sales team Download our new guide on AI and sales, and you will learn how to support your sellers in leveraging AI to gain a competitive advantage, communicate more effectively with their buyers, and ultimately sell more with less effort. Go to Full Funnel Freedom slash AI to get your copy today. That's fullfunnelfreedom.com slash AI. It just illustrates this idea of, I call it linear thinking, right? Where the CEO is like, this is how we do things around here. Well, that's great, but that's also what the buggy whip manufacturers uh, <laughs> and the CD manufacturers used to say as well. Um, and I get that buggy whips and CDs still exist. However, they are significantly smaller market than we used to uh, have for both of those products. So, all right, Dan, so we've got the why, right? So let's uh, let's dive into this like, how do you go about this, right? So as a sales leader, you've bought in, right? Someone's listening to this podcast and like, this is brilliant. I'm going to do a win back campaign. I think this is great. I don't want you to give away the secret sauce, right? I want people to reach out to you as well. However, what are some of those things that a sales leader can do to communicate to their peers at the leadership level, right? Who might feel similar to that CEO and how can they make sure that this is successful with the salespeople that they're leading? Because again, those salespeople are probably going to feel in some way rejected by some of the prospects, the former clients that they're going asked that they're being asked to go out and recommunicate with. So, in, in your business, like how much rejection does a, a salesperson get? Well, and in sales, you get you hear no a hell of a lot more than you hear yes. That's just a cliche for a reason, right? So, you know, in, in general, uh, like the belief I have is it's seven no's to get a yes. And a yes could mean I'll meet with you. It doesn't mean I'm going to give you business, but you, you have to talk to eight buyers. Seven of them will say, I don't want to talk to you. And the eighth one will say, I'll give you a meeting. Now, that that meeting might turn into nothing. It might just be a nice one meeting and then, you know, not a good fit. So right. in general, if we if we just use that number, which I read about in a book years ago, we've got, a, you know, seven out of eight times we're getting rejected. Exactly. And how tough is that? Right? Well, Emotionally? Well, it, it's, you know, is even if you have thick skin like I do, um, it, it still hurts because I'm still a human being. Exactly. And and when you call somebody um, that you did business with before, mm-hmm. within it only takes one to three touches to re-engage with a past customer. That number comes from Jeff Blunt's fanatical prospecting. Love it. And so it's like you might reach out to a cold prospect 30 times, mm-hmm. you know, before you can get their attention or, mm-hmm. or, um, or get them to respond. This is dirt easy. One to three touches. And you're mm-hmm. and 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 so often they'll be happy to hear from you. I mean, how nice is that emotionally? I mean, look, it, <laughs> I had to go through a lot before and 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 learn a lot and go through a lot of the process totally. before I felt comfortable with it. But I mean, you know, um, uh, if if you've got a, even if you've got a salesperson who's struggling, mm. you want them to feel better about themselves and get yeah. them back on the course. Give them a bunch of old accounts. Yeah, you can say, listen, you know. Uh, We've, uh, you know, we we haven't talked in a while. You know, we're we're trying to do better. Mm-hmm. Uh, where did things go sideways, or where did we leave things? Mm-hmm. And what we find so often is that things fell off the off the off the off the plate for mm-hmm. no good reason. 
Carl said this this one uh, this that first client that he went back. He says, you know, I don't even know why we are not doing business with us anymore. Did you guys reach out, or did we did we not get back to you, or how did that happen? <laughs> and these are stories I hear all the time. I love you it. Know? So so I think that I think the whole thing is is that selling is easier. You can you've got all kinds of uh, mm -hmm. data on them. Mm -hmm. You know who the decision mark makers are. You know when mm -hmm. the buying window opens. Mm -hmm. You've got contacts within the company um, who can who can tell you stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can start having real meaningful conversations. And because you've seen inside their company before, totally. you know so much about what they want and what's important to them. And then you can go in and 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 craft messaging and craft mm -hmm. an offer that. That is really relevant to them, and when you, the more relevant you can be to them, the more likely they'll take your call, repeat, you know, and, and get back to you. And you can actually have it make a deal happen. Yeah, I I agree, and I and all of that, you know, as I'm listening through my sales leader ears, you know, if I can if I positioned it to my sellers in the way that you just did, about it's way easier, it's a lot less, it's not necessarily stranger danger. Right. Cause that's, I mean, even yeah. again, we're selling the human beings. We're human beings. We all have stranger danger. That's why, you know, people, that's why sellers have challenges with prospecting. Okay. So sellers got it. Now let's look up at our peers on the leadership team, right? We've got our CEO, we've got our CFO, we've got our, uh, you know, operate chief operating officer. We've got all those people and they all have their own hopes and fears and dreams and worldviews and ways that we do things around here. So when I, I'm i going to, and you know, chief marketing officer, right? Because I'm going to have to get my peer on the marketing side uh, if they don't necessarily report directly to me, if, we're, if we have that separated, I'm going to have to convince them that this is a really good idea. Mm -hmm. um, and we should invest our resources. And you've already given us some of those really cool numbers. What are some of those messages that you've supported your clients with in making this an acceptable thing at the leadership table? The leadership team has agreed on uh, whatever their strategic um, goals are for that year. Totally. Right. Maybe, they, maybe they've got um, uh, specific sales targets. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're, it's, it's about uh, increasing market share this year. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's about increasing profit. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, let's just say that you want to grow market share 15% this year. Mm -hmm. The fastest, easiest path to that is with Winback because these people are predisposed. You know, they bought from you before. I mean, you've yeah. got a, a huge advantage of selling to them than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Now, the way that growing market share would work is that, like, let's just say, for example, you did a, a Winback campaign and you did, you you were going to, you'd spend X number of dollars mm -hmm. per person to Winback. So you, you say, okay, fine, I'm going to. I'm going to make uh, three phone calls, mm -hmm. three emails, and whatever follow up. Right? Sure. So you'll spend a hundred bucks to get them back. Right. Well, so you would do that. Then you would follow it up with with maybe a direct mail campaign. Mm -hmm. Then you might follow it up with um, some kind of event. You know, you spend a lot more money to mm -hmm. get each person back, but you could get so many more back. We what we do is we just stack approaches, right? Stack approaches. Right. Um, so they're more expensive, but you'll get more market share. There's other, uh, say your profits are in the toilet. You could okay. say to the CFO, well, listen, what we, we've got all these high margin, we've got this 20% of our lost customers are we're very high margin. Mm -hmm. If you want to improve our profit for the lowest amount of cost, here's these, this, this group of high margin people that we can go after. So you want to hit a sales target. This is halfway sure. through the year, right? Yeah. And you, you're, you've got X. Say, say your, uh, your sales cycles are nine months. Okay. You've only got six months till the end of the year. Mm. You know you're not getting your sales target. Sure. However, if you go and to your past customers, you're going to find the sales cycles are so much shorter. So now you know what to focus on. There was actually a lady, and uh, that was that was her exact situation. Mm. Uh, they were in the uh, HR. They were an HR agency, and the sales cycles were nine months. Mm. And at six months, they were selling the company at the end of the year, and it was oh. really important to have big, big numbers. Totally. And, and so uh, she had a, a a real stretch goal. Anyway, long story short, she said, "I'm going to stop all new prospecting. Whoever's in the pipeline now, mm -hmm. stay in the pipeline. Sure, but nobody knew. We're only going to go after uh, after lost customers. Um, mm. The sales cycle turned out to be just under four months for that group. So uh, by by the beginning of the fourth quarter, they were they were she was gold. She had uh, she generated uh, 1.5 million in new win back revenue. The cost was so much lower 
um, than getting that new. And um, they, when they put all their people on it, because it took so much less time mm -hmm. for them to win these people back, they were able mm -hmm. to hit every every last customer in the last five years. Absolutely wow. incredible. That's a great uh, a great illustration of how this could be powerful. And and listeners, we will link to the episode in the past called "Is Your Sales Year Already Over," which dives deeper into that idea of like what is actually your sales year look like. So when you know when are you going to maybe need to make a shift into looking at winbacks as a way to actually hit the numbers if you're already off pace. Dan, uh, clearly you and I could nerd out about this stuff like all day long. Um, and you both, uh, both you and I have things to do, including you have a book uh, to write. So uh, I got a few questions before we wrap up today. Uh, I'm going to put it out there right now. I would love to have you back when the book's out so we can dive deeper into this because I think the audience will uh, appreciate uh, some more insights than we were able to cover today. So first question, if you could go back and coach younger Dan, go back as far as you like and go, hey, younger Dan, in the future, you're going to have this amazing thing called Winback Labs, great podcast. You've, you've built an amazing business. You're also going to have a bunch of scar tissue and bumps and bruises. What would you coach younger Dan to say or do differently to get to the same place with fewer bumps and bruises and less scar tissue? I was going to say be fearless. Like, don't okay. worry about these things. I mean, there's going to be, there's, there's, there's not so nice people and there's nice mm -hmm. people. You're going to bump into both of them. Don't mm -hmm. worry about it. It's going to happen no matter how much, how scared you are. So just, just go for it. Just True. go for it because all it will do is accelerate your, your success. I love that. Be fearless. That is a great message for everybody. Now, uh, the side from the book you mentioned earlier, which we will link to in the show notes, what else have you read, watched, listened to uh, in the past or recently that you would encourage the sales leaders listening to check out to further their own professional and personal development? You know, I'm uh, I'm reading the new Elon Musk book. Okay, and, and he has like story after story of things that couldn't be done, mm. and he just said, "Let's just let's just do it. Like sure. let's figure out a way of doing it." And and like he he got he fell on his butt a number of times. And said, "Oh my god," you know, I I I, um, I was just reading about about uh, they needed these new nose cones. Mm. And there was going to take months to do the nose cones mm -hmm. uh, for, for the rockets. And he said, yeah. and, they did it, they, they, and, and the engineers said, couldn't be done. They said, let's do an all night session. Well, we'll all work together, him and these four engineers. Mm -hmm. And we don't have this equipment and that. There's all these reasons not to, why it couldn't work. Mm -hmm. And he made a reasonable, they did a reasonable job overnight. Perfect. Crazy. Anyway, the, the whole thing is, is that there's these self-limiting uh, beliefs or behaviors that we put mm -hmm. on ourselves. And it was kind of like reading this book. It's like, okay, why don't we shift those off to the side for a little bit and see what happens when we can get rid of those. What a cool message. Yes. Thank you for sharing that with us, Dan. So the last question for you, you have shared amazing ideas, insights, uh, wisdom with us already. What is a closing thought, another bit of wisdom or, or something you want to plug? The floor is yours. What I'd like to say is just give one back a try. Take one, one of your sales mm -hmm. reps, uh, someone who's open to trying this, research five or 10 of your past customers, the ones that are, you had a good relationship, the ones that mm -hmm. are easy to talk to, just take that, that easiest path and just give yourself a shot at seeing what, what, what went back could do for you. Just put yourself out there with a tiny little test. Beautiful. Dan, what a great way to close this up. I'm very excited to uh, welcome you back when your book comes out. Uh, thank you for being a guest on Full Funnel Freedom today. Thanks so much for having me, Hamish. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Full Funnel Freedom Podcast. You can continue to support us by leaving us a review and a rating, sharing this episode with a couple of sales leaders in your network who you care about. I'd love to connect with you. I'm easy to find Hamish Knox on LinkedIn. Also, if you'd like a free 15-minute call with me, go to www.hamish.sandler.com forward slash how to Sandler. Until we connect on the next episode, go create full funnel freedom.